Welcome back to the weekly news roundup. I hope everybody had a wonderful week and I hope everyone's ready for a wonderful weekend. Today, we have our regular battery. We have privacy, security, AI, business, and Sillyville. And once again, we are going to cut back on the affiliate uh, advertisements uh, a little bit. Uh, I realized when I cut my articles down to two articles in each section, and then we had an affiliate between each section, we had way too much stuff going on. And uh, I just didn't like it. Guys, I I skip ads too. It's all good. But hey, I might talk about something you want to hear about. So uh, we'll do that. Um... But anyway, let's go ahead and dive on into privacy news first. First up, Microsoft's new co-pilot AI can read your files directly. TechRadar says it is not the privacy nightmare it sounds like. Not yet. I mean, it might become. Now, what they're uh, what they're doing here is Copilot now has the ability, at least in their testing builds. So presumably, this is going to be finding its way into the main production build soon. Uh, what they're going to do here is um, they are going to allow you to import a document of a variety of different file types, PDFs, documents, things like that. They're going to bring these into the different uh, file types and allow Copilot to read through it, scan through the document, and give you any information that you want. And so that is really what uh, uh, that's really what they're they're working on doing. And so with that um, uh, with that then um, what they're saying is it's not nearly as privacy uh, disrespecting as you think it might be. But that being said, I have a sneaky, sneaky suspicion that um, uh, it is actually going to be a lot worse than that down the road. I have a sneaky suspicion they're probably going to sneak this in. Now, I don't have any evidence of that at this point in time, but this is Windows. They're trying to cram AI into everything. They're trying to maximize its usage, and they're trying to maximize data. So I don't think it's outside the realm of possibility to suggest that it might be scanning through some stuff anyway. As at least on the surface, it does not look like it is. So we'll have to wait to see if any more empirical evidence comes about to see if anybody else, you know, finds some code that seems to suggest otherwise and stuff like that. So um, with that, um, uh, then what we're going to do is assume that I personally am going to assume the worst because it's Windows trying to cram this stuff in, but I'm not going to absolutely say affirmatively they are stealing all of your documents and information. Next up, uh, this is up in Canada, but uh, it merits a discussion because it's similar laws and similar issues going on in the United States. This regards a person's IP address and Of course, in the United States, you can usually get an IP address pretty easy with a simple subpoena or things like that. And so what this case hinges on is there was a guy who was actually doing legitimately illegal things, but they his lawyers were trying to were trying to get evidence thrown out of court on the basis that the IP address itself is private data. So the question is, before this, the Supreme Court in Canada, is is the IP address itself private data or is the IP address just the thing that leads to getting private data? And that's really what the question happens to center around. Now, this is significant because here in the United States, I looked into this and uh, a law enforcement does not need a warrant to get an IP address. It may not even need a warrant to demask private information off of an IP address. Usually it requires a subpoena or oftentimes it just requires an emergency declaration from the police that we need this information. Uh, which is not a warrant necessarily. And so it's very interesting to see the the kind of interplay going on in in light of this. But this dealt with a person who, I believe it was like worked at a gas station or something and was skimming credit cards off the side and everything was going through a single server with a single IP address. And when the police were investigating this, they had to figure out what the IP address was first. And the lawyers for the defense were trying to say, well, you can't do that without a warrant because they were just trying to collect the, uh, the IP address as part of a basic investigation without actually having the warrant. And so this really is what started the law up. And this sent up the 
ruling up to the Supreme Court in Canada, which ended up ruling five to four, that the IP address itself is protected personal data. And so in light of that, they, I think in this case, they had to throw out some of the evidence. But now a lot of people are coming back and saying, ah, for the children, you know. And so they're saying that this new ruling has already said that anybody trying to investigate uh, certain crimes against uh, younger populations are going to have a lot harder time, which that very well might possibly be true. Um, but at the same time, I'm not quite sure what the, uh, what the issues happen to be here as far as, uh, what constitutes the start of the investigation, what constitutes the information you need for the warrant, what constitutes the information you need for a subpoena. And so it raises some interesting and fascinating questions about the IP address itself in our Northern, uh, Northern neighbors. So, uh, yeah, that's interesting. Well, moving on over to security news. The FBI reports in 2023, internet crime reached $12.5 billion in losses, which was a major increase. So you can see it's going up. Uh, So the total complaints going up and the total losses going up. Of course, you'll notice that the complaints from 2022 to 2023 didn't raise significantly, but the cost, man, eh, went up quite a bit, you know. Um, it does look to be to be somewhat proportional, but they're saying that it's going up. It's still climbing. And in 2023 so far, they're already up there. So they say in 2023, FBI, ICE, IC3 received a record number of complaints, trolling 880, um, uh, 880,000, which represents nearly 10 percent increases. Those uh, the reports are conservative. Concerning them is only a small amount of victims report the crime. So here's complaints over the last five years. Let's, is that the same chart? Did they really give us the same chart twice? I think they gave us the same chart twice. Uh, and then here is the the breakdown of crimes. You actually notice I actually found it was very interesting. The SIM swaps were actually near the low on the list. And that's one of the most concerning ones. So that's probably good news. You'll see that phishing absolutely tops it because... Phishing and spoofing, of course, super easy to do. Personal data breaches, non-payment, non-delivery, extortions, investment, tech support, identity theft, BEC, confidence and romance scams. There you go. Stop doing weird, kinky things with people on the Internet. Jeez. Government impersonation, credit card fraud, harassment, stalking. Um, um, I could say something about VTubers, but... eh. Real estate, other advanced fees, all sorts of weird stuff. So what they're saying is it's going up and it's consistently going up and it's still going up. Massive surges because really there's nothing that can be done. There's no real jurisdiction. There's nothing can be done. And frankly, the big problem about this is our entire world is going onto the Internet and it's being forced to go onto the Internet. It's not like, hey, we're just putting a bunch of stuff out there because, hey, we just want to. Everyone is forcing us to use the Internet on things things that the internet probably shouldn't be used on. And now we're wondering why there's so many data breaches and scams and all sorts of other stuff. Maybe we need to go back to a slightly more cautious internet cautious and maybe a slightly more Luddite like society and see if that might actually help to, um, uh, help to solve some of our issues there. Um, Speaking, though, of major scams, Meta uh, Meta abandons hacking victims, draining law enforcement resources. A collection of 41 state attorneys uh, generals have written a letter to Meta say, hey, you guys need to actually take proactive steps in stopping scammers on your network because what's happening is people are reporting into Facebook and saying that um, uh, they're saying that the... Uh, uh, their accounts have been breached. They reached out to Facebook and Facebook is doing nothing. So the attorney generals are now going into Facebook and saying, listen, we can't be your tech support. You need to fix these issues. And I'm going to say Facebook and Meta. uh, Now, one of the the part of the allegements here is that what's happening is people are hacking into accounts and then they're overbuying ads. They're doing other things which are actually profiting Meta. So Meta, by failing to properly act on these cases, is actually being enriched themselves. In fact, I talked about this on the channel. One of my clients that I have to use their Facebook accounts for, 
their system was hacked. And then we don't even know how. We have full two-factor authentication in. Um, it, everything that accesses it, for the most part, is secure stuff. they got to be... I don't even know how they're doing it. But they got in, and they did the very same thing. They're alleging here that they got in, and they tried to take out a $1,500 ad buy on my client's credit card. Now, we're very visual, in, and so we caught it within 24 hours, blocked it on the credit card level, took the credit cards off the account, and reported it to Meta. Uh, I think it was like three months later they contacted us back. Uh, but in the meantime, ever since this happened, we have had hundreds, hundreds of fake meta support guys with the exact same copy paste. Your account's going to be suspended. Click this button here to verify your account. Hundreds of them. And it's the same copy paste script. They should have been able to block this a long time ago. Facebook is a group of hackers. They should know how this is working. The only explanation for this is that Meta knows it's going on and doesn't care because they are being enriched. So go 41 attorneys generals, get together and completely take a big old bite out of the pocketbook of Meta and this might actually solve it. Of course, the only downside about this is it's being led by Letitia James, uh, who does not exactly have a super stellar reputation right at this point in time. So, uh, very fascinating. Uh, <laughs> but I've seen this in, in real world situations. So, uh, this is absolutely true stuff. Well, if you want to help support the channel, uh, I do have a science fiction book. Of course, I'm at a writer's conference, so of course I have to talk about my books here. Uh, so um, the book is Synaptergy. This is a good science fiction short story. Um, I'm sorry, it's a science fiction novel. Um, of course, we do short stories over on Patreon uh, and our other support networks, and those will ultimately be collected into a book that is available. But in the meantime, I do have Synaptergy available. It is a family-friendly uh, science fiction story. So if you are looking for something for uh, you know a teenager or a young adult or something, it is a good family-friendly one. You can read the first chapter or listen to the first five minutes over here. We did confirm this since the last time I did this do this ad buy. Since Spotify has taken over one of my audiobook distributors, you can now listen to this and all of my other audiobooks for free ad supported on Spotify. So if you have a Spotify account, you can go ahead, search up my name there, uh, Murosky, M-U-R-O-S-K-Y. You can find all of my different books over there, listen to them for free ad um uh, uh, ad supported on Spotify, or you can just come on over here and you can buy a copy of it. If you want to listen to the audiobooks without that, you can buy a copy of it from a variety of different places, including our website where you will get a DRM free copy of the book. And then, of course, we have ebooks and print books available to you as well. So that is Synaptergy, which you can get at synaptergy.com or tlm.li forward slash s. And uh, with that, let's go ahead and have a look at some AI news next. First up is Elon Musk is suing OpenAI and Sam Altman over the betrayal of the nonprofit AI mission. Now, of course, some people, mostly the uh, Elon Musk is now of the devil crowd because he lets people speak freely on the Internet. Uh, those people are saying, Elon Musk is a foolish idiot. And then other people are looking at this going, hmm, interesting. Uh, some legal scholars are saying he doesn't have a case. Some legal scholars are saying he might actually have a case. I don't know, because, you know, A, I'm not a lawyer, but B, I do find it very fascinating uh, as, a, as a question and as a debate. So this is definitely one to watch, and I don't know which direction this is going to take. I'd love it if some of the lawyer channels out there might uh, chime in on this guy. But the hinge pin of this is that Elon Musk is one of the early founders. He's one of the co-founders of OpenAI. OpenAI, under Elon Musk's initial round of funding, and Elon Musk is a co-founder who initially launched the company with his own, uh, I think, $50 million investment. And in the OpenAI original founding documents was that OpenAI, as its name suggests, OpenAI was supposed to be a free and open source uh, a um, artificial intelligence specifically there to benefit humanity. And what his allegement is, is since um, Microsoft is now the primary investor, they have taken it completely closed source and are using it explicitly as a money making tool, abandoning the 
freely available, open source, and uh, beneficial for humanity approach that he originally wanted to have and that the company was founded on and the original founding documents were on. So the question is, is does Elon Musk have any standing to enforce the original founding of the company so long after he has left the company or not? And that really is the hinge pin. And I did see that he's suing for his money back. What I see is he's saying, hey, it should be openly available, all source code openly available uh, and to benefit for humanity, not to enrich Microsoft. Of course, shortly after this, Microsoft has been buying up some other AI startups as well. So I don't know if they're running scared or if they're just trying to become an AI dominant on the market. But it's a very interesting thing to see what's going to go on with that, uh, of course, because everyone's really opinionated on this because you either completely love or completely hate Elon Musk. And uh, in our currently deeply political base here, uh, it would happen to be that uh, people tend to want to take their legal opinion based upon their personal personal preference or opinion of individual people. And so that's a very interesting thought. So I'm watching this case closely because this is a very interesting one that I have no earthly idea which direction this one is actually going to go. And our last article here in AI is job applicants shut out by AI. The interviewer sounded like Siri. So this is really just a big, long article. I did read all of this uh, just to summarize the points here. Um, obviously interviewers are trying to use AI to cut back on the number of applicants to screen because in some jobs, people are getting 10, 20, 30,000 applicants, uh, for individual jobs. Now, some of that might very well because people, People are using AI and just writing an AI script to apply for anything and everything that they might possibly fit under, which in and of itself is crazy. But that being said, there's so many job applicants coming in for a limited number of jobs. And so some companies are utilizing AI to do the first round of screenings. Now, after this controversy had comes out where guys like um, he believed that this was AI because it was basically a, a, a patronizing robot that kept on cutting him off. Did what definitely was not having a conversation with a human. And this is what he recognized. He says, uh, after cutting me off, the AI would respond, great, sounds good, perfect, and move on to the next question, Ty said. After the third or fourth question, the AI just stopped after a short pause and told me the interview was complete and someone with the team would reach out later. And so... Uh, Basically, uh, a survey from Resume Builder released last summer found that by 2024, four in 10 companies would use AI to talk with candidates in interviews. Of those companies, 15% said hiring decisions would be made with no input from a human at all. And that is terrifying. It begs questions for me. Man. I am so happy I am not a young person looking for uh, employment these days because I could not deal with trying to go through a, even just the the process of applying for a job on the internet for like mcdonald's you know go to mcdonald's you see we used to go into the fast food restaurant see it, it was it was part of what you did as a person you had to humble yourself walk into the fast food chain and ask the person at the front for a job application now everything's done by the keyboard warrior on the internet and nobody sees anybody and then it just goes into a giant pool and then it's oh we need a guy over at this restaurant 10 miles away well i'm 16 i can't go 10 miles away you know and so that is uh there's a lot of issues but now we add the extra complexity of having ai involved in this decision making and now it's like people feel like they're not even getting a a simple chance it's like how is the ai making the decision about which person they're they're moving on it's completely unfair in that respect now of course other people are coming back and saying well now i'm going to use ai on the other end so now we basically have ai applications applying for jobs that are being interviewed by ai so the ais are going to out ai each other and pretty soon we're just going to have a giant robot war and then the AI is just going to decide to hire the other robot anyway and say yeah screw that human um, just plug him uh, put a little plug in the back of his head and use him for our power supply instead that might be the only thing he's useful for but that's what's going on in the light of all of this they're talking here about the human element being lost which is my 
ultimate issue. You know, I, I am sorry. I, if a company does not have enough respect for me who applied to your job to actually interview with a human, I'm going to uh, show you my two favorite uh, canaries and uh, possibly move on. Of course, if I were trying to do that this day and age, it might be really hard to find a job, which is very frightening because it should not be this difficult to find a job. We should not have to be subjecting ourselves to impersonal internet forums, impersonal internet interviews, AI interviews, or uh, quiz quizzes written up by AIs that are like these weird, complicated uh, sociopathy questions based explicitly for a fast food restaurant. I'm sorry. Like, I actually did have do one of those as paper. I applied to like a country fair. It's on the East Coast. It's like a, just like a little gas station, kind of like a, you know, a, a Huawei, a Sheets, a Bucky, you know, just a basic small convenience store. A little gas station, a little convenience store inside. And they're like, here's the thing. But every single question is like, how many times do you drink? How often do you get drunk? It's like, like, dude, like every question is like this. I'm like, I wrote at the top, I don't drink. Period. Didn't get the job. Oh, he must be lying. Everyone drinks. <laughs> no, I don't, actually. Uh, <laughs> but that's the thing. When, when you get these impersonal questions, they're like, whatever happened to, I'm going to fill out an interview, and then you're going to call me, and then we're going to sit down at a table and have a face-to-face -face conversation. And if I can't do that competently, maybe I shouldn't have a job, but why are you screening people out with AI? It's very fascinating. Well, there's our uh, thoughts there. Let's head on over to business news next. First up in business news, Apple will make it easier to move to the Android ecosystem by fall of 2025. This has to do with the EU's Digital Markets Act. Now, the sideloading of uh, the iOS apps is apparently is only going to impact your phone if it is in the EU. I did not see anything about this particular move, so I'm not sure if this is an EU thing only or if it is something that will be available global. But the concern is is that once somebody gets into the Apple ecosystem, you know they have all their text messages, all their emails, they have all their photos there, and it's very hard to switch over to the Android if you're like, I want to drop Apple and go to Android. It's very difficult to do that. So this new law in the EU requires the easy portability from one ecosystem to the other, which I think is really a good thing. Now, I will point out that there is actually a Google app that allows you to do this. Um, so uh, there's the Switch to Android iOS app, which allows you to migrate contacts, calendars, photos, videos, and messages but some less critical data is still missing and users still have to disable iMessage to make so their new messages actually do come to their Android device. So uh, allegedly the Apple stuff would probably have to fix those on the basis of the law, but I don't know for sure. And so uh, that is so good news that uh, at least we're starting to see some movement in this direction that is going to force a company like Apple to not lock people inside of an ecosystem and keep them there because it's just too difficult to move out, which is a good benefit because, you know, if you want to get off the the um, the big corporate anyway and switch to a next cloud, you want to be able to do that. Now, it's still possible to do all that. It's just not necessarily as easy as it is, as it probably should be for our current era and that's exactly where apple wants to position themselves but the eu comes in and slaps apple around again say nope got to make it easier to switch which means that apple now has to just work harder to keep customers rather than to risk losing them that easily and second up in our business news is uh if i can get rid of the stupid stuff there uh open source elections this is an interesting discussion now this is from mit technology review which is about as left wing as they come um and i the reason that's important to bring out is because they do use some fun words in here like conspiracy theorists and all sorts of things of course to uh talk about all the people that had some legitimate questions about some things going on in some alleged possible uh maybe fictional elections i don't know uh but that being said there are a number of people that are starting to push the idea of, hey, we actually want to be able to audit the voting system. And so this is a massive article. And so it is definitely worth the read moving into election season. A lot of this um, is looking at a new company, which is 
working towards having entirely open source voting machines. And so the idea here is that if you can audit the code and all of the equipment used to make the machine is readily available and easy to audit, then it will be much more trusting of your election. Now, I personally still like paper ballots, and there are some voting machines that work on paper ballots. I, I can't remember if it was in Pennsylvania or if it was when I was in Wyoming. One of those still used paper ballots, and then you use the machine just to scan the ballot. So it would tally the ballots, but there's still a paper record of your vote. I think that that's the best approach because it's easier to audit. It's better to audit. Now, hand counting the ballots, I understand why you might not want to do that. And yeah, you can go back and say, well, all throughout history of the country, we did that. Yeah, we also have a lot bigger population now than we did. We have to understand that as well. So I understand that the need here, but what the article says is that right now, over like 90% of all of the voting is dominated by three completely closed source proprietary companies and uh, private companies, meaning there is no accountability of their profits. We have no idea who's funding them. We have no idea how the code works. We have no idea how the hardware is built. And this raises massive amounts of mistrust in any instance where any such proprietary machine could be used. So some towns are trying to replace the voting systems by some of your big three with more open source platforms. And so this company moves in to say uh, to really push open source to say, hey, all of our source code is available. Everybody can use it and can audit it. All of our hardware is available. We know where every component is being made. So it's it builds a trust model that if we have to use digital voting methodologies, at least if it's all open source, they are 100% transparent in how that is happening. And so that is definitely uh, that is definitely what um, uh, what I would like to see. Now, here is why I brought up that this is such a left wing group. This was a hilarious paragraph in this. Already, there are indications that bad actors have acquired proprietary voting machine code. In 2021, an election official in Colorado allegedly allowed a conspiracy theorist to access county machines, copy sensitive data, and photograph system passwords. The kind of insider attack that experts warn could compromise the security of a coming presidential election. So I just want to point out to MIT Technology Review and everybody with the sound of my voice, if this guy is a conspiracy theorist who is actually able to extract the stuff, he is not a conspiracy theorist, now is he? Just a thought, folks. Just a thought. But if you do want to help support the channel, we do use affiliates. Say we are highlighting DigitalOcean, tlm.li forward slash doh for DigitalOcean hosting. And this is going to get you really good cloud services on a variety of different applications. And uh, so if you're looking for either um, we're using a restream server over here, of course, to stream this on five platforms simultaneously. That's all done on DigitalOcean. We are also doing web hosting. We are doing a Jitsi server. There's just all sorts of different things that we are hosting over here on DigitalOcean. It is excellent for any type of cloud services that you might, uh, might need to have. So that tlm.li forward slash doh, which is for digital ocean hosting. And with that, guys, let's move over to your favorite place and mine. Let's have a look at Sillyville. First up in Sillyville, Google now wants to limit the AI-powered search spam that it helped to create. So this is exactly what I'm talking about with the dangers of AI. We release AI. People use AI, and now the entire internet is completely full of of SEO-optimized AI nonsense garbage, and it's completely outranking every legitimate site, and now nobody can find anything, and Google's like, hmm, this is a problem. So now they're going to have to figure out a way to ban all of the crap that they actually led to. So this is kind of exciting. They're generally talking here. A lot of it is the affiliate stuff. Of course, we just did an affiliate spot. But the thing is, is that you can do affiliate marketing right. And I have a page that explains how we manage affiliate marketing. And I have taken affiliate links off of my servers before. 
because the company has lost respect or reputation or done issues. I don't push every affiliate link I can at everybody just for the purpose of making money. I legitimately only use the services that I trust and I keep doing the audits. If I hear that a company is not doing well, I start investigating. And if I find the company has indeed dropped in reputation, I drop them from my affiliates. The problem is a lot of people have figured out that if you just write a whole bunch of positive fluff reviews about every service under the sun, like every commercially available crappy WordPress theme, which are extraordinarily easy to hack and horrible for hosting sites on, but you just talk up SEO articles about how great they are and cram affiliate links all over the place. You can make a lot of money doing that. I don't want, I'd rather not just make money on selling crappy affiliates, but that's exactly what's going on. And now Google is trying to uh, fight the problem that it helped itself to create. Very fascinating. Uh, next up, of course, we just did have a uh, leap day in the leap year. Of course, um, February 29th only occurs every four, uh, every fourth year. And uh, some of these uh, new finagled uh, DEI programmers that uh, are just basically uh, putting stuff together from GitHub um, or Stack Overflow diagrams, uh, they just didn't know how to get the dating quite right and uh, messed some things up. So we did have a, uh, a, a Y2 every fourth year thing going on and uh, gas pumps, self, uh, self-paid self gas pumps over in New Zealand all stopped working. Now, it would have stopped working everywhere except it caused a massive loss of revenue. And so uh, it allowed everyone before the time zone, before 20, uh, um, before February 29th rolled around, most of the world got this patch. Just remember that if you think that the that the t- the turning of an exact date is going to cause the end of the world, just look to New Zealand to see what's going on because they hit the new time zones first. So there's a thought, but uh, yeah, gas pumps stopped working because the the new payment processor programs did not know how to handle leap days. So <laughs> that's exciting. And onto our last article in this section here is some new AI is being used to make famous portraits sing. So uh, here, Mona Lisa recite famous Shakespeare monologue. Chinese engineers managed to get a picture to sing and to talk using an AI app called Emote Portrait Live. So um, here you go. Here is a reference image, and here is the generated image. So yes, now we actually have talking Mona Lisa. Uh, I believe this was their website. I'm going to double check where their website was. Um, I think this was it here. I have no idea if there's actually audio in any of these. So let's see. If there's audio, I'll have to cut the audio. But we were good. Yeah, that's probably going to be. Um, so this is just an image. There's a generated. Uh, these are individual people there. Here's your photo. Okay, we're just going to mute that just because I don't know what's... To imagine me... Oh, there you go. His love. Okay, this is just reciting Shakespeare. Okay, we can get that one. Yes. One. And in this manner. He was to imagine me his love, his mistress. And I set him every day to woo me. There is some piano playing in the background, so I don't know how that's going to turn out. But uh, there you have it. Um, You can do that. Oh, we can even do... We can even do these guys here. Okay, then. <laughs> oh, boy. We got the Joker. You want to know these scars? <laughs> I don't know if there's going to be... Uh, there's background noise on that one as well. Very interesting AI, but, yeah, now we can make our portraits all sing. So, um, there you have it, guys. Well, if you want to help support the channel, we do have a series of uh, different ways to help support. We do have a Patreon page available over on uh, patreon.com slash T-O-M-M. We have a subscribe star page at subscribestar.com slash switched to Linux. And we have a uh, locals page as well over at 
switch to linux.locals.com. All of the benefits are, are, are all the same. Help support the channel. We do have um, uh, monthly science fiction short stories related to modern technology. We have those in print and in audiobook format. Uh, eventually, those will all get published into an ebook as well. I'll offer the ebook to the supporters as well. Uh, and uh, we also have the Thursday shows, the online or the offline component. So if you want to help support the channel, you can do that on over there, any of those three support networks. With that, thanks for watching, and we will see you all next time.